thanks for the tokens received, he closed the letter to the king of Siam with strange grace and humor, saying, I appreciate most highly your majesty's tender of good offices in forwarding to this government a stock from which a supply of elephants might be raised on our soil. Our political jurisdiction, however, does not reach a latitude so low as to favor the multiplication of the elephant, and steam on land as well as water has been our best agent of transportation. Meantime, wishing for your majesty a long and happy life, and for the generous and emulous people of Siam the highest possible prosperity, I commend both to the blessing of Almighty God. He sent hundreds of telegrams, suspend death sentence, or suspend execution of so-and-so who was to be shot at sunrise. The telegrams varied oddly at times, as in one, if Thomas Samplow of the 1st Delaware Regiment has been sentenced to death and is not yet executed, suspend and report the case to me. And another, is it Lieutenant Samuel B. Davis whose death sentence is commuted? If not done, let it be done. While the war drums beat, he liked, best of all the stories told of him, one of two Quakeresses heard talking in a railway car. I think that Jefferson will succeed. Why does thee think so? Because Jefferson is a praying man. And so is Abraham a praying man. Yes, but the Lord will think Abraham is joking. An Indiana man at the White House heard him say, Voorhees, don't it seem strange to you that I, who could never so much as cut off the head of a chicken, should be elected, or selected, into the midst of all this blood? A party of American citizens, standing in the ruins of the Forum in Rome, Italy, heard there the news of the first assassination of the first American dictator, and took it as a sign of the growing up and the aging of the civilization on the North American continent. Far out in Coles County, Illinois, a beautiful, gaunt old woman in a log cabin said, I knowed he'd never come back. Of men taking two fat prophets out of the war, he said, where the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. An enemy general, Longstreet, after the war, declared him to have been the one matchless man in 40 millions of people while one of his private secretaries, Hay, declared his life to have been the most perfect in its relationships and adjustments since that of Christ. Between the days in which he crawled as a baby on the dirt floor of a Kentucky cabin and the time when he gave his final breath in Washington, he packed a rich life with work, thought, laughter, tears, hate, love. With vast reservoirs of the comic and the droll, and notwithstanding a mastery of mirth and nonsense, he delivered a volume of addresses and letters of terrible and serious appeal, with import beyond his own day, shot through here and there with far, thin ironies, with paragraphs having raillery of the quality of the Book of Job, and echoes as subtle as the whispers of wind in prairie grass. Perhaps no human clay pot has held more laughter and tears. The facts and myths of his life are to be an American possession, shared widely over the world for thousands of years as the tradition of Canute or Alfred, Lao Tse or Diogenes, Pericles or Caesar are kept. This because he was not only a genius in the science of neighborly human relationships and an artist in the personal handling of life from day to day, but a strange friend and a friendly stranger to all forms of life that he met. He lived 56 years, of which 52 were lived in the West, the prairie years. All right, so let's turn now uh, to this essay and get a sense of how we want to read this essay. Now, let me make a couple of quick observations to you as freshmen. I have already given lectures that you can find in the junior folder at LearnStrong.net if you're interested before you read your junior year in hearing what I have to say about Abraham Lincoln and more particularly his Gettysburg Address. In this conversation now, we're going to focus specifically on what is it that this writer, uh, Carl Sandburg, is most interested in in Abraham Lincoln, this greatest of all presidents. And right away, let's go ahead and say it out loud. Sandberg is interested in you realizing 
that Lincoln is an unknown commodity to most Americans. Let's say that out loud. Sandberg's going to point out that Lincoln is an ironic figure in history, right? And when we start to look then at some of these theses that he's going to outline, these ideas, this central idea, he's going to, at the very end of this passage, call Lincoln, first of all, a genius, right? No question. Second of all, he's going to call him an artist. By the way, it's fascinating that Sandberg would call a person a genius who, who never had major education. He was basically homeschooled. The fact that he calls him an artist is fascinating because, to our knowledge, Lincoln never really did much in terms of painting and that kind of thing. He calls him a strange friend, but more importantly, a friendly stranger. If there's a single line that encapsulates what Sandberg wants to say about Lincoln, it is this. And why does Sandberg want to say this? The answer is contained in the notion of the myths that surround Lincoln. It's easy to say he was the greatest American president of all time, but what does it mean to say that he was a dictator? That he abandoned the rules of normal law, especially the Constitution, to do what he wanted to do. Of course, as they say, the proof is in the pudding. That is to say, we were engaged in a great, as he calls it, great civil war in his Gettysburg Address. He had to do some things that normally you would not expect a president to be allowed to do, and yet he did it, and he got away with it. Sandberg then is interested in, let's put it this way, in his biography, the whole person. Not just one part of the person, but the whole person. And so even today, our reading of this text will kind of make us ask questions. In other words, was he really that great? Was he a great leader? Did he do the things he had to do so that the nation could endure? Does that make it okay? In other words, a question we'll ask is, is it sometimes good to do bad? Let's write that question down. Is it sometimes okay to do something wrong if your motives are for something good or great? Right? Like, for example, keeping the union together. Let's go back to the beginning of the essay and point out right away the genius of the way this opens. He begins with the reference of April Lilacs, as juniors will talk more about the great Walt Whitman, who's also mentioned later, because Whitman had one, Whitman, America's greatest poet, Whitman had one contact with Lincoln in his life, and about that contact, he was able to talk at length about it. Of course, notice uh, the uh, mentioning of April Lilacs, when Lilacs Last and the Dooryard Bloomed, is Whitman's most famous poem, along with Oh Captain, My Captain, most famous poem in reference to the killing and the assassination of President Lincoln. So he starts with the death of Lincoln. Jot this one down. Why do you think Sandberg begins with the death of Lincoln? Why start there? Well, of course, because a lot of people know if they know anything about President Lincoln, they know that he did his job and then somebody put a bullet in his head. But of course, that begs the question, and let's watch it. This is brilliantly subtle. Watch this. Why would anybody want to put a bullet in the greatest president? See, I've asked this question before, and freshmen go, dude, I guess I haven't thought about that. If he's the greatest president, he's on Mount Rushmore. People will often put him as the number one president in the history of the United States. If he was so great, then good heavens, why would anybody ever want to put a bullet in him? Well, Sandberg very subtly is going to say, I'll tell you why he would uh, somebody want to put a bullet in him because he had a lot of enemies. Enemies? The greatest president in the history of the world had enemies? Oh yeah, he had a lot of enemies. And many of them, are you ready for this, were his friends. People very close to him who said to him, you can't do this. This is against the law. This is wrong. Sandberg's very interested in those stories. In other words, he wants to share the stories that people don't talk about. He wants to share the Lincoln People even today often don't understand. I've had, I've had uh, adults even who will say about this reading, I never realized. I, years ago I had a mother who was reading with her daughter every night to help her be able to do the readings. And she let me know when she read this passage, she was kind of stunned. I didn't know that about President Lincoln at all. Well, it kind of makes him appear as kind of a bad guy at times. See, that's going to be our question. In other words, let's say it this way, Sandberg wants to take Lincoln from being deified as a god down to something we call human. He was a human being. He had both sides to him. 
just like you have both sides to you, right? This is why it's uncomfortable to ever talk about a good person or a bad person. They're just people, and they make all kinds of choices and decisions. We're very interested, of course, now in taking a look at Lincoln. By the way, uh, Sandberg will point out on page 501, this word despotic means dictator. The despotic power that Lincoln had was, of course, incredible. He directed political and spiritually the wild, massive forces. And then, of course, he begins to talk right away. Look at the very first thing he points out. Four billion dollars worth of property confiscated. Whoa! Well, that's against the rules. Over, over on to page 502. Uh, when uh, the Harriet Beecher Stowe, the writer of Uncle Tom's Cabin, met him, and, and there's d historians debate whether this is in fact true and it ever actually actually happened, uh, that he said about her that this novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, had actually started the Great War, the abolitionist, um, great abolitionist novel. We'll talk more about that in your junior year as well. Um, uh, and again, the notion, I shan't last long after it's over. The observation, as they were finishing their talk, he said, this is what he said about himself, I'm not going to live very long. In other words, let's put it in our notes, somehow, notice, we began with Lincoln's death, somehow Lincoln knew that he wasn't going to make it. He somehow knew that this would probably kill him. Let's put in our notes as well at 3A, Martin Luther King Jr., the great civil rights advocate, he said something very similar, that he had feelings at times that he probably wasn't going to make it through the experience, and others would have to continue his work, right? He conti um, Sandberg continues by saying about Lincoln, he, what... What made him interesting were the things often that he said. He, uh, when it was said, I, I would have never thought that somebody like you would have ended up president. He says back, uh, neither would I. But it was a time when a man with a policy would have been fatal to the country. I never had a policy. I'm on page 502. I never had a policy. I have simply tried to do what seemed best each day as each day came. This is a fascinating idea, and it immediately wipes out a lot of the arguments for or against Lincoln. Well, he wasn't this or he wasn't that. Lincoln himself says it. I didn't have a policy. All I had was a passion for the country. I cared for the country, and I wanted to see it survive. We should point out, historians will tell you this, you wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for Abraham Lincoln. Most, uh, most people argue. You certainly wouldn't be sitting in the country that you're sitting in right now if it wasn't for Lincoln. And yet... Wow. Well, he did some bad things, didn't he, right? He says it. I'll have to violate the Constitution if necessary to save the Union. Whoa. There's the question again. Is it ever okay to do bad for good reasons? We have a tendency today to drop sharp distinctions in this way. Carl Sandburg's pointing out Lincoln is a classic example of a, of a president who did some bad things, but for good reasons. And in the end, of course, the survival of the Union proves that maybe he was right. The list of enemies on page 503 is compelling. Dude, these are some important people who really disliked President Lincoln. In other words, let's say it this way. We have to say that Lincoln was a man who had major enemies and yet was an effective president. So in other words, it's not always about being well-liked, is it? Sometimes it's about being effective. By the way, notice that the Chicago Times as well, the daily newspaper, constantly against him. In other words, he didn't always have the media on his side. Propagandists is the word that's used. But notice what, what um, Sandberg calls him, the stubborn man of history. Let's write that down. The stubborn man of history. Well, everybody's coming in and telling him, uh, you're, you're an idiot, you're doing this, you're doing that, this is not good, this is bad, etc., etc. He's stubborn. He won't give up. He won't quit, right? Stubborn man of history. And his argument is compelling on page 503. The reason he's stubborn is because we're one country. And what makes the symbol of one country? The Mississippi River. The Mississippi River. The Mississippi River runs, of course, horizontally, north-south, up, th up uh, um, through the country. And therefore, it belongs to both the north as well as the south. It's one river, and therefore we're one people. This is, of course, the heart and the thesis of, of the essay. There it is on page 503. His, Lincoln's, life, mind, and heart ran in contrast. There's the line. Let's write it down. In other words, you can't see Lincoln as a monolith of a figure. Contrasts. There's two different sides. There's multiple sides to this personality, and that's what makes him so amazing.
Of course, he made it through the thralls of war, the terror and the valor of war. Um, um, and then, of course, we have Whitman's line at the bottom of 503, um, the grandest figure on the crowded canvas of the drama of the 19th century, right? A Hoosier Michelangelo, and this is why at the very end we'll come back to this notion of, uh, of uh, Lincoln as artist, right? He hates the politicians on page 504. He was a chosen spokesman who was silent. Note the irony of that one. He didn't get much sleep. I don't know if you've done this, but you can Google this and look at a picture of Lincoln when he came into the presidency and then a picture of him four years later. Almost doesn't look like the same guy. Almost doesn't look like the same guy. Why? He didn't sleep very much. He was so, he was, uh, he, he was so challenged and he didn't sleep very much. And we know that this affected him, no question. The tragedies of his life are listed on page 504. We often think this, well, great people who have all the power, they must live great and amazing lives without lots of problems. No, no. Notice the list of all the problems on page 504. I've had freshmen that say, I never knew this. Look at this. His hat was shot off as he rode alone one night in Washington. A son he loved died as he watched at the bed. His wife was accused of betraying information to the enemy until denials for him are necessary. His best companion was a fine-hearted and brilliant son with a deformed palate and an impediment of speech. And on and on and on it goes. In other words, let's put it in our notes this way. One of the things Sandberg wants to say that makes Lincoln heroic is that he had to overcome a lot of terrible stuff, hard stuff, right? When you are, for example, in your life having some really rough experiences, you can remember Lincoln had some terrible experiences as well and yet overcame so much to become the greatest president. Of course, if a single word encapsulates what it is that Sandberg wants to say about Lincoln, it is the word irony. He was a walking irony, we might say, right? Um, and of course, he loved his humor. So for example, as he shook hands with the correspondent of the London Times, he says, right, I guess the London Times is about the greatest power on earth, unless, of course, perhaps it's the Mississippi River. There's all kinds of irony, economically speaking, in a line like that. Lincoln was aware that it would be that Mississippi River that ultimately would make America the greatest power in the world. And, of course, it did help to make America the greatest economic power in the world, right? The humor is a part of it. Notice we're told that on page 504 at the very last lines, the man is the most cunning person I ever saw in my life. He's a liar. He can say one thing and do something else. He can tell people, all right, you got a right to vote, uh, you know, somebody in office, and then once they've done it, well, I already picked who we were going to put in office anyway. What? You can't do that. I just did it. What? We today would think about this as being the act of a tyrant or something. And here Sandberg wants to tell us that, notice at the top of page 505, he manipulated, constantly manipulated. And note the irony of this. He manipulates but he hates politicians. Let's jot that one down, it's an interesting irony. He hates politicians, people that will sit kind of in their own little special place and have their opinions. He hates these kinds of people, but he himself is a manipulator of policy. How do you explain that irony? How do you explain that duplicity, we might ask? It's a fascinating one, right? Of course, he's got this exchange with the King of Siam at the bottom of page 505, which shows that he was revered and loved by people outside of the United States. And then on page 506, very famous about the letters and the telegrams that he sent, sometimes requesting that somebody not be executed, sometimes making sure that the execution might take place. In other words, you can't get a political bead on this guy. You can't say, oh, politically he was bing, 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 bing. That's the kind of guy that he was. Sandberg says, no, he didn't fit into those kinds of simple boxes. Are you ready for this? That's what made him great. That's why he was effective in the most significantly dangerous time in our nation's history. That's what made him significant, which is fascinating to think about it. Let's say it out loud. Sometimes schools don't always work for certain kinds of students because they're seen as the naughty students, the bad students, the rebel students. And yet, what's Sandberg going to argue? Those are the people who end up making the history of the world. Why? Because they have, what was our word? Stubbornness. They're stubborn. Don't tell me what to do. They challenge authority. They're the ones that say, I know you think you can get away with that because you have authority. You can't get away with that because you have authority because I don't think that's right. 
Whoa, that's a temperament type. That's a personality type. And you're looking at his picture on page 506. There's the man. There's the man. He was the guy who was not predicted to ever be anything great. He came from absolutely nothing. In other words, Sandberg wants to argue for your notes, Lincoln is what America is. He embodies what America is. The ironies, the conflicts, things that are not so clean. People that try to talk about America in some kind of clean, simple one-liner need to study the life of Lincoln, Sandberg says, and then they'll have a completely different understanding of America. We're not this simple country that can be easily explained by a one-liner, just like Lincoln. So when you call him the greatest president, Sandberg's arguing, when you call him the greatest president, you need to understand all the sides of him, everything about him, not just one thing about him. It is true he got us through the war, it is true he saved the Union, but it's also true that he did a lot of other things that you might not so easily approve of. Big deal. He was our great president. That's the point that Sandberg's wanting to make. He wants to make him human. And in making him human, he makes him even more remarkable. Of course, lots of people have pointed out just what a great joker he was, right? And yet, an enemy general, Longstreet, after the war on page 506, declared him to have been the one matchless man in 40 millions of people. Of course, again, he packed a rich life with work, thought, Laughter, tears, hate, love. That's a compelling list. That's a compelling list. And by the way, that's the list of a person that I once heard called a human being. Go back to that list. Look at it. All those things are in your life too. Work, thought, laughter, tears, hate, love. That's called your life. It's only that Lincoln is going to present all of those things in an amazing symphony which is, again, why he's called not just an artist, but a genius, right? And then notice...